Hi everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking today about how to write for the online medium. So how many people in the room are content writers? Okay, all right, so probably there'll be quite a bit of this stuff that you know or have learnt in the past. Hopefully there might be one or two things that um, you'd maybe forgotten about and hadn't been sort of present and in the top of your mind or even one or two new things. And for the rest of you in the room, hopefully there'll be lots of new things to learn from this session. So I do have quite a lot of um, content in my content session, um, but so I'll be moving quite quickly, but at the end there'll be time for questions and I'm always available after the session finishes as well. So, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a corporate writer with an online specialization. Um, I've also done a lot of work as a trainer, so teaching people how to write, running sessions like this one, but more focused on um, you know, helping to people improve their writing. Um, I've also done a lot of training in corporate writing, but also in creative writing, which I'll talk about in a little bit, because um, in a past life, I'm also an author, um, and so I've got a PhD in writing. And that's some of my book covers. Just to add a bit of colour. So today we're going to look at um, some information about online users um, and then we're going to look at how to write for scanning readers and go through a few of the specific things that you can do to help people who are scanning the page. Um, and then finally we'll do a, um, a very quick overview on what writing for accessibility looks like, how to build that into your content writing. So first of all, I always like to ask this question, what makes a good writer? Is it talent or skill? What do you guys think? Talent or skill? Yeah? I think it's like a skill you can learn. Skill you can learn? Yep. Anyone else? So, everyone's a bit quiet. Sometimes Some people say 50-50. I even ask this when I teach my creative writing tasks and of course, perhaps not surprisingly when you're teaching a creative writing class, people will always say, oh, it's 90% creativity. But in reality, it is a skill that we learn, improve, and that is why people can become writers and improve their writing. Um, and often, even when people say, so-and-so is such a talented writer naturally, it may be that they have read more, read more books, and so they're um, unconsciously taking the note of the way um, good writing looks, or that they had a really good English teacher. So often, even when we think it's talent, it can actually be about a skill as well. So let's have a look at some information about online users. So how do people read online? So there's actually quite a lot of research, which a lot of you may be across, particularly the content writers in the room, um, on online reading behaviours. The Nielsen Norman Group are leading the way. And um, I've been, uh, without giving away my age, been in, in this for quite some time. And even back in when I started in um, online writing was 1999. And even then, Nielsen was, um, had already produced a lot of research around how people read and the best way to write for online um, users. But a more recent one is how people read online, the eye tracking evidence. Has anyone read this or seen this? Yeah, it's quite an interesting one, so something you might want to look at. I'm going to give you some of the information from here, but it's something you might want to um, look at um, purchasing and, and reading some more. It's quite a detailed little report. Um, so one of the first things, or the, the, one of the main lessons is users scan content. Now, that's probably not an earth-shattering revelation, except that what is important is to think about that when you're writing your content. Whether you're maybe a Drupal developer in here and you're writing your own blogs or want to get into writing some blogs or whether you're one of our uh, professional content writers in the room. So it's good to always keep that front of mind that people are going to be scanning the content you are writing. Um, so you need to write for scanning readers. So before we look at how you can write for scanning readers, I want to just provide a little bit more information about scanning because that eye tracking evidence from the Nielsen and Norman group has actually shown um, a few patterns, but the three main patterns that they were able to observe by looking at where people, by tracking people's eyes, literally tracking their eyes and where their eyes were going on the screen, they were able to identify three really common patterns. The first one is the F pattern. So you can see here, the user is, there's a bit of an F there, tail is down there, so the person is reading almost all of the first paragraph, and then they're starting to scan with a preference to the left a little bit. So you can see that's the F pattern. The other common pattern that people use is the layer cake pattern. This is where people scan the subheading. So often they're actually scanning subheadings to find the information that's going to be relevant to them or that they're looking for. 
And the other most common pattern is a spotted pattern where people are drawn to different things. It might be headings, it might be keywords, it might be hyperlinks, bolded words, all those things that draw the user's um, eyes to that particular word or that particular section of the page. So who reckons they might use the F pattern when they're reading? No one? What about the layer cake pattern? Yeah, I think that I probably use that one. I use the F pattern a bit. What about the spotted pattern? Does anyone feel they're kind of scanning completely? Yep. And the reality is I think a few of you put up your hands more than once. So often we may be using a combination of all these three patterns when we're reading content online. So now let's go and say, well, what does that mean in terms of writing? How are we going to write to address these different patterns? So writing for scanning. Um, so the four key ways we can write for scanning is to have clear and concise headings and subheadings, uh, place important information up front, using some different formatting techniques, which we're going to talk about as well, and using plain language and keeping content clean, clear and concise. So I'm going to talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail. So let's first look at clear and concise subheadings. So it obviously helps scanning readers. We can see that just from that layer cake pattern that probably was the majority of people put their hand up for that layer cake. So if you've got some really well written, clear and concise headings and subheadings, and a lot of them, not like crazy, but you know, quite a few. So you're really breaking up that content into those headings and subheadings. You're gonna be helping the readers that are scanning. The other thing is it does, it creates a lot more white space, which is much more inviting. <clears throat> if you're shown a wall of text, whether it be in an email or even a, a letter that comes in the mail to you or an online document or an online web page, you're obviously going to be much more um, liable to dive into it if there's a bit of white space than just this wall of text. Um, clear and concise headings and subheadings or, um, should summarise the content in that section. Again, think about that layer cake pattern that we just talked about. If you're scanning the subheadings to decide if that section is relevant to you, it's really important that that sub subheading actually has the information about what the person's going to find in that paragraph in that section. Ideally, four to six words long, sometimes hard depending on the topic we're writing about, but if you always aim for that, if you're one or two words over, you, you, you're going to be in a better place than having a, a sub, subheading that's two or three lines long. Um, and also keywords at the start. So if you can, and this helps with SEO as well, search engine optimization, um, if you can, try and have your keywords at the start. Sometimes it can be handy to have a question, so what is and then whatever it is that you might be talking about, and in that case the keywords at the end of the subheading. But if you're not asking questions in that sort of way, then try and um, front load it so your keywords are at the start. And that again, thinking about that F pattern in terms of the gaze pattern we saw, um, that helps people who are scanning with a combination of the F pattern where they're looking at the starts of words and the starts of the headings and also using a bit of the layer cake where they're looking at the subheadings and headings. <clears throat> so here's some examples here. So if we have a look here, we've got um, a subheading here with quite a short little paragraph, another subheading here with a short paragraph and some bullet points. And again, on this one on the left, you can see the use of um, some headings and subheadings there as well. So we're not having a huge amount of information. You can see this idea of the white space to make it a more inviting page to the reader rather than, as I said, that wall of text. So these are sorts of things that you're looking for in your own writing and also when you're looking at other web pages I'm sure that if you're looking at these sorts of web pages that have a lot of subheadings and other ways that we chunk um, content that you're going to be much more drawn into it and able to get the information you need out of it much more easily. Uh, so if we go back to these four ways we've just covered clear and concise headings now let's have a look at placing important information up front. So in terms of going back to this Nielsen and Norman research uh, this is some really, really good facts for us to know, some nice stats. I always like a few good stats. 81% uh, of users looked at the first paragraph. So again, remember, this is the eye tracking where they're actually looking at where the person is looking. So 81% looked at the first paragraph. So that's pretty good. 71% of users looked at the second paragraph. 63% of users looked at the third paragraph. So already, by the time we get to the third paragraph, we're getting a, a big, well, not a big drop, but we're starting to get a drop from that 81 to that 63. 
but the most significant drop, as you'll see, is from the third to the fourth paragraph. So what does that look like as a visual? It looks something like this on the, on the right here. So you have you know, a lot of concentrated focus on the first paragraph, a bit less, a bit less, and then a lot less again. So that's again very important for us to be mindful of this research and this pattern of behavior for online users when we're writing. So has it, I know the writers in the room would have heard of this, but we'll do it anyway. Who's heard of the inverted pyramid structure? Woo! Um, okay, and the other people in the room are going, what are they talking about? So the inverted pyramid structure, it includes a summary or the most important information at the top of the page. So basically, it's you have the essential information or a summary, important information, and a background information. It was probably first used and has been used for a long time now in newspaper writing. So if you pick up a newspaper, whether it's a physical one or an online newspaper, you'll probably notice by the time you read the heading and the first paragraph, you've got a pretty good idea of the story. It goes back to that kind of who, what, where, how. And then sometimes the why might be buried a bit deeper. But just to pre present that really important information up front in your first paragraph. For websites, what you might actually see happening is having a little summary at the top here. And this is what the Nielsen Norman Group website does as well. And so you actually include, so in the example on the right, this is about the New South Wales Companion Card, and you've got a summary information. So at the very least, if the readers only read that page, and that, sorry, only read that first part of that page, they have an idea of what the content's going to be. And it also helps them if they're scanning to know if they want to read the rest of that page, if they need to find another page. Perhaps they've discovered they haven't actually come to the right place. Okay, if we go back to our list again, we've covered the first two. The next one is formatting techniques. There's quite a few different things we can do with formatting te techniques. Who was in Diana's presentation earlier today about plain, plain language? Yep, me. So there's actually a bit of crossover as you're about to see as we go into some of these techniques here. Okay, so formatting techniques help scan it, that, that help scanning include headings and subheadings. So we've already covered that, but as I said in, when we were looking at it, it really does help the scanning reader. It invites them in, it creates a white space. They can scan just the headings and subheadings, get an idea of your content. Short paragraphs, also really, really important. They create white space, but they also um, allow the reader to get the most important information quite quickly. Bullet points and numbers, numbered lists that naturally draw the reader's attention. Again, there was a brief mention um, in this morning's presentation about um, using bullet points. And then the next one is designs or page layouts that are broken into chunks. And this was probably what Diana's talk this morning spoke the most about was this idea of page layouts and chunks and breaking up the page. Um, and also occasionally we see bolding keywords and that may be even hyperlinks as well. So including hyperlinks, draw the reader's attention. Again, coming back to that idea of the spotted gaze where people are being drawn to either perhaps a bullet point list, bolder words, hyperlinks. So let's, oops, sorry, I'll just go back. So let's have a look at that in action. You can see a page here. We've got the headings and subheadings. We've got the short paragraphs. We've got the bullet point list, which in this case are done as checklists. We've got some design chunks here by having this little section here that um, helps to break up. For, so it's not just heading, paragraph, list, heading, paragraph, list. And then we've also got that little section there. Short paragraphs are better for scanning. Two to six, so a lot of times when you say short paragraphs, everyone will say, but how long? How long is short? Generally, two to six sentences per paragraph is ideal. Also, importantly, use short sentences within your paragraphs. We're going to talk about these in a little bit more detail. So in terms of lists, bullet points and numbered lists draw the reader's attention. And it also helps with the spotted gaze pattern. As I said, they're able to just quickly go into those little spots on the page that, is draw that are drawing their attention in. Importantly, ideally each list item should be short, one line if you can. Again, just thinking about the way readers are scanning, it's much heavier for them to be having to read full sentences in bullet points than those short little lines. Design chunks again, 
So here's an example here of we've got some different visuals, um, some a video, and then a, a, a kind of grayed out banner. This is another example here where we've got different cards, some uh, background color with the, with the gray again. Um, and here's another example here where this is a full page and these ones I've cut off the footers. Um, but the footers also help to create a little bit of a sense of those design chunks as well because you can see the colors are different. So they're just a few examples to show you how that, which is a design rather than writing, but obviously we have to write the content for those designs. Um, so just to bear in mind those nice chunked um, designs as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was thinking that was a fast 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, so looking at formatting for scanning still, but now looking at bolding words. This one you have to be a little bit careful of because, you know, it looks pretty bad if you've actually got a page that's got a lot of words bolded. But every now and again, sort of, I'd call it a light touch, it can really help to communicate some ideas. So even if we have just a little short sentence about what is a companion card and just bolding significant and permanent disabilities will help to um, cue readers into that detail. So if we come back to our original list, we've now covered the first three. The last one we're going to look at is plain language and keeping content clear and concise. So again, as I mentioned, a little bit of overlap from this morning's session, but more I see it as it's actually a bit of a different take, so it's sort of complementary. Okay, so some principles apply no matter what you're writing. I don't know if anyone's heard of the three C's of writing, but the content should be clear, concise and consistent. We're not going to talk about consistent today, um, but normally, um, you know, that is something that you should look at. And that's just consistency with even small things like tense, not going from past tense to present tense and changing tenses in the middle of a paragraph. Um, you know, if you're using a word and you're using a hyphen with it, like co-founder, always having it hyphenated rather than sometimes not hyphenated you know, only capitalizing your proper nouns, all of those things to keep it nice and consistent. But we're going to focus a bit more today on being clear and only a very short bit on being concise. So let's go now straight into um, how to be clear. So we should choose simpler words. So rather than having those really long words that perhaps sometimes I think, and you know, this particularly applies um, to people who aren't content writers, People think that, in, you know, particularly if they're writing even emails or something, they think they have to use the big words to show that they um, have a good grasp of the language or that they're speaking very formally. But in reality, 99 times that, well, probably 99 million out of 100 million times, um, shorter words, simpler words are better. Uh, the only, actually, I wouldn't say that because if anyone's done any academic writing, I mentioned before that I've done a PhD in writing. I had to try and relearn everything because they like these really long, fancy words and I had been spent 20 years doing the opposite. So that is definitely an exception to the rule. But certainly in online writing, simple. Um, and you should also keep sentences short with a single statement per sentence. And that can be as simple when you're editing content as splitting up a sentence um, from, two, from one sentence into two sentences. Should use the active voice. Who's heard of the active voice before? The content writers in the room again. Oh, and a few others. Um, and also avoiding jargon. I think we've probably all heard about that one in terms of plain English. Um, and make sure your writing is well structured and to the point. Let's have a little bit more of a, not a deep dive, but a, just a, a quick look at each of these in a bit more detail. So some examples. Um, by the way, the Australian Government Style Manual has got quite a good list of some of these words. But, you know, you often see copy that says assist or aid when you can just say help. Um, generally, we, for amongst, we drop the ST and we just have among now. Approximately can be shortened to about. At a later date is just later. Endeavour, try. For that reason, because in light of the fact that can just be shortened to since. So these are just a few examples. You can easily go online and have a look up a lot more of these. If you're writing a lot, um, and particularly if you're not used to writing with these simpler words, then you can also look at you know, printing them out and having them stuck on your computer so that you can always reference them. And for a lot of times, people find that they have a particular phrase that they like to use, like maybe in light of the fact that, and they start a lot of sentences that way. And once you become aware of it, then it's easy to change it. 
Okay, so in, in terms of keeping sentences short with a single statement per sentence, um, obviously the shorter sentences are much easier to read and understand. We're going to talk a little bit more in a moment about, um, about that. So here's just an example of if we take one long sentence and just cut it into two sentences, you're automatically making it a lot easier for someone to, to read and understand that sentence. Even if we don't do any of the other things, just that one change will help a little bit. And then, of course, once we start doing some of the other things as well, um, then you're in a much better position. This first example has is a sentence with 36 words. The second one is two sentences, one with 23 and one with 15. Now, the reason why it's good to use simple words and also short sentences um, is because we need to write content that can be understood by someone with a lower secondary school education. So this was one of the things that was mentioned in this morning's session. So this is one of the requirements from the Global Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG 2.1, and, and which they say lower secondary. The um, Australia's Digital Transformation Agency went even a bit further and said year seven. But you get the basic idea, you're aiming for year seven to year nine in terms of someone who has a year seven to year nine education could read your copy and understand it. Particularly important in um, websites that are going to the general population, for example, government websites. Um, but also, um, you know, even someone with a, you know, a master's or a PhD will find it a lot easier and faster to find the information they're looking for if it's written at a year seven level. Now there are some online tools to help with accessibility. I'm going to show you one, if I can get my mouse there. Where have you gone? Oh. There we go. So this is just a, a you can get lots of um, different tools. In this morning session, uh, the presenter talked about Hemingway. Um, this is uh, just a free WebFX one. You can either enter in your URL for existing content, or if you're writing content in a Microsoft Word document or a Google Doc, you can just copy and paste it into, um, get that up. You can just copy and paste it here and then calculate readability. And what that does is it gives you a readability in terms of the year level. So you can say, oh, my content is currently at year 11. So what can I do to bring it back down to year seven or year nine? And the reason why um, we talked about, I've got up as part of a heading, simpler words and short sentences. So the way that these are calculated, the way that the reading age or year level is calculated, it looks at how long your sentences are, so literally how many words are in a sentence, so that's why short sentences are better, and it looks at um, how many syllables are in your words. So again, that's why simpler words are better. So if you use shorter, simpler words and shorter sentences, that will automatically bring down your reading age. Sometimes when we're dealing with things, it can be difficult if we have like a, um, a technological term, for example, that's three words and longer words. You know, you, you start to get into a, a bit of difficulty with those terms. But even if you look at the copy aside from those terms, you're trying to get those simple words, those shorter sentences to get that um, uh, reading age year level down. Okay, so now onto the active voice. This is a very quick um, description of what the active voice is for those of you in the room who don't know. Um, it is quite complex to, to grasp at first, um, so it's something that you might want to go and do a bit more research on after this. But the advantages of it, it's clearer, more direct, and more concise than the passive voice. So sentences are either active or passive. Um, and so what is it? It explicitly states who or what is doing the action and it starts a sentence with this information. So if we look at passive examples, the house was burned by fire instead of the fire burnt the house. The latest engineering techniques were outlined, outlined at the conference versus engineers outlined the latest engineering techniques. And the same with the next one. You're just changing the order of the words so you're starting with who or what is doing the action. As a little bit of a cheat hint, you'll notice that often in passive voice you have this was, were, and then by. So as I said, you might want to go back and read more and find out a bit more about that because that's a very quick intro into active-passive. 
Um, avoid jargon. I don't think there's anything more I need to say about that one. I think that, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, discussion about that within any kind of content circles. I think probably most people know, whether you're in content or not in content, that you try and avoid jargon where possible. Now, make sure your writing is well structured and to the point. So, one of the things here that I like to do is to always think about the audience and objective. So, and sometimes it can be as simple as at the start of your document, when you're writing in, in something before you go onto the web, you might have literally have it spelled out audience and objective. And then you're continually going back to what you're writing and saying, am I addressing it to my audience and am I meeting my objective? Or have I gone off on a tangent that's really just not necessary? Um, I liked, for those of you who weren't in this morning session, I actually quite liked the, um, the user story concept of as a, and it was, it, it's actually kind of another way of doing this really. Um, so it was like as a and whoever the audience is, so it might be, you know, as a member of the scientific community, I um, want to so that I can. Um, so it's again about the objective, but it's just a different way of thinking about it and phrasing it. And if you keep those things in mind, it'll really help you um, to structure your content and to stay on point. And that will obviously help it to be clear and concise as well. Um, and often it's really good to just, sometimes before you even start writing, just write out what your main points are going to be, even like bullet point format. You may find that they actually become your, your subheadings for your page. The only thing I'm going to say about the concise, I'm going to keep the concise part of this concise, which is why use 20 words when you can say it in 10? And also just to let you know that there has also been a lot of usability studies that show that content is much more usable when it's concise, even to the point where people are able to, to rephrase what was being communicated on the page more easily if it's written in a concise way. Certainly when you're using all techniques, like making sure it's clear, making sure it's concise, using some bullet points, short sentences, simple words, um, then usability is significantly increased. So remember our four ways. Next time you're down, sitting down to write something, Use clear and concise headings and subheadings, four to six words long, keywords at the front if possible. Place the important information up front. Think of that um, uh, pyramid, inverted pyramid. Use some of the formatting techniques we've talked about, bolding, um, lists, headings and subheadings again, and, um, and uh, using designs that have chunks. Uh, and also using plain language to keep content clear and concise, simpler words, shorter sentences. So the last thing I'm going to look at is writing accessible content. I'm going to go to my notes now because I've got a little bit more of detail in here. Uh, so choose your page titles carefully. So make sure the page title is descriptive and gives the users an idea of the content they'll find on the page. If you do this, you're going to meet WCGA 2.4.2 level A. The other advantage of two of having good page titles is that page titles are very important for um, SEO, search engine optimization. So you really want to make that page title work hard for you. Again, short, like our subheadings and headings, four to six words, front loading with your keywords if possible. Unless you're doing a like a what is, because what is actually also returns very well in SEO. Next one is to co use contextual links instead of click here. Who still sees click here on the, oh, I know it drives me crazy. It's as bad as apostrophes in the wrong spot. Um, yeah. So yes, click here is still out there somehow. Um, so, but I mean, I think the reason it's out there is because people don't know this. And if they don't know, how can they not do it? So it's important to understand why click here is bad. So in terms of the WCAG, it's 2.4.4, uh, which is to have uh, link purpose in context. So what that means is, if you've got to imagine you've got a screen reader, so people who are using a screen reader will so often have the settings to read out the links. So if they're reading out the links and it just says click here, they have no idea what they're going to find if they click there. But if you have something really descriptive like download 2022 annual report, and that whole link is hyperlinked, then that, that's what's going to be read out to them, download 2022 and your report, and they know exactly what they're getting. So that's what they mean by contextual links. Next one, <clears throat> 
Provide labels and instructions when content requires user input. This is WCAG 3.3.2, level A again. Mostly applies to forms. So if you've got forms on your website, make sure you include some instructional content or that it's clear with a you know, heading of name or whatever information needs to be put into that box. Um, again, similarly related, keep labels, instructions and error messages clear and easy to understand. It starts to go, it's a bit of an extension on the one before, it takes us into level double A. Uh, also use descriptive headings on your pages to organise copy. That is actually applies to two, WCAG 2.4.10, which is level double A, and also our level triple A there. But again, it nicely correlates with our writing for scanning. So it gives you two reasons to do it. Oh, and the SEO, sorry, three reasons to use descriptive headings. One is for scanning, one is for SEO, and one is for our um, uh, accessibility requirements. Oh, that might be. Oh, my page's gone. There we go. Write for the lower secondary school education. I've already mentioned that that is part of the WCAG guidelines. Um, provide definitions for unusual words. We're getting into some AAA ones here, um, but just to uh, remember to do those as well, uh, whether it's a glossary, uh, for example, so you're not interrupting your copy or a tooltip or something like that, as long as it's accessible. And provide the expanded forms of abbreviations. Usually the, the standard is to do, even if you're using like a company name like National Australia Bank, you then put in brackets NAB, close brackets, and then after that you can always use NAB. Okay, so that is the end of the formal part of the presentation, um, but I'm ready for questions if there are any. A few questions? Have you got the microphone? Oh. You have to repeat the question. Okay, yes, uh, here. The readability tool that you showed? Yes. It, is that for any form of English? I believe so. What for, form were you thinking of? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, that's fine. Yeah. Sorry, the question was, was the, user, was the readability tool for any form of English such as US English? And the answer is yes. It just does, does um, mostly the syllables and sentence length. Second question. Example of the Australian tool for the Concise words? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Do you know of a style manual for the US? Uh, well, the, the US, do they use the Chicago Manual of Style, I think? I don't know whether there's a government one in the US. I know they, a lot of, there is. yeah, a lot of publications used to use the Chicago, I think it was the Chicago style, but I'm not sure. Sorry, I don't know that one. I'm usually trying to change people's copy to get rid of the Zs and put in the Ss instead. <laughs> <laughs> Going the other way. <laughs> and just behind you, there was a question? Uh, yeah, about the summary content. So um, if you're including a summary paragraph, you can also include the Is there an item linked to that? Or is it, you know, make it longer than it needs to be to cover that? Like our area, our work, so the question is about um, the summary at the top of the articles or pages and how long it should be. Look, I don't think there's a magical length. Part of it is a visual thing. Like you'll see if it's, and it depends to how your how the website CMS is set up. If you have got that area in the header to put it, um, you're going to wind up with a very big header if you write a long, long one. So you are trying to keep it short. And what the main thing to remember is, even if you can't fit every single, you know, summary of every single message into that, if you can just take out the most important ones, at least that will let people know that they're on the right page, that they want to scroll down to find the rest of the information. So, but it is, you're right, it's a balance, trying to find that balance of what visually looks good as well and that is not giving them a wall of text um, and providing that summary information. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, another one? Um, you split the sentences there to some of the English words and reading to that is really the paragraph. So is that something to aim for? Like I know you know when you first learn you sort of like to say they're saying that people are the, the subject in the, you know, the paragraph or paragraph is around the same subject and the people are lined together. Is it there for this purpose? Yep, so the question is about um, when you're 
splitting up. So in the example, I had split up a, sen a, a sentence into two sentences and I'd also included a paragraph return. I'll speak to that first, which is I actually have to confess I did that just to make it more visually obvious to you guys as I was showing it. So that was not how I would have done it in the real copy. But in answer to your second part of the question, which is about um, you know how long, kind of about how long a paragraph should be in terms of being taught through our early years of um, primary and secondary school, that if something is the same topic, it should live in the same paragraph. Certainly, um, you're much more likely to, to turn two or three paragraphs into five or six paragraphs if you're writing for the online medium. So you would cut at places where you might not cut if you're just writing um, a book or something like that. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you.